such an honor to be here and was here the first service and just had to take a moment just because I remember your senior pastor as a youth pastor and coming to our church and you know seven shirts t-shirts and ripped jeans and boots <laughs> youth pastors look and uh and I just remember him sharing his heart. I'm going to plant a church. And I said, man, whatever we have to do, we'll, we'll be a part of it. And just to stand here and to see it, it's been a miracle. I told him, man, I'm standing in a miracle right now. You know, you're going to move into a beautiful building. It's going to be beautiful. Don't allow prestige to take over presence. This is a tent. You're not coming because you're a tent. You're coming because you're getting the presence of God in this place, right? You know, they say, this defies all church growth model, right? Build a great church. Have the, you know, the Disneyland kids ministry. No, if you have the presence of God and Jesus be lifted up, people are going to come. Come on, right? It's a miracle. We love your pastors, and, and they're like family to us. And um, they, he, he has spoken really into the life of our church and, and uh, really into a lot of our young leaders at our church. A lot of them were very impacted by his ministry. And so we're so grateful for him and his wife. And you guys are in the best hands. You guys, y'all got the best pastors. And can we honor them right now? Amen. Why don't you stand to your feet real quick as we open up God's word and the reason why I like standing is just in reverence to God's word. And, you know, God's, the word of God is the mind of God. All, all thoughts are, are just silent words. If you want to know what God is saying about your situation, well, just open up your Bible. People say, Pastor, I need to hear him. No, no, you need to read them. Just, so I love getting, get up in the morning, have my devotions. And <clears throat> it's like you're getting into the mind of God. Okay, God, what are you saying about this? Let me find it. And uh, we, we, we're going to dive deep. Can we go deep today? Yes. Open up your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 15. The book of 1 Samuel chapter 15. A very familiar story. It says, Samuel said, Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken that the fat of rams i want to take the next few minutes and speak to you on a subject called the overflow of obedience let's pray father we thank you for the spirit of revelation and give our minds illumination that we would experience transformation god i pray you give us a mind to perceive and a heart to receive all that you have and i ask that after this message we will never be the same and all the people that came to the 11 o'clock service because you woke up late this morning, say amen, amen. Well, before you're seated, give someone a high five and say, you wish you looked as good as me. You wish you looked as good as me. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I went into this year not just with an excitement, but I went into this year with a revelation. And that revelation came by a time when I was running. I love to run. It's my therapy. And I would pass by this tree that bared great, big grapefruits. The difference was, was that we had a windstorm the night before and the tree had bent over and the wind got the best of it and the roots came up and the first time i was able to see the roots because every time i passed by i saw the fruits and the lord spoke to me and he says obed 2024 is going to be the year of obedience and my response to god was well lord that's not inspiring i need something inspiring he says, yes, it's not inspiring, but it's aspiring. 
it's going to take you higher than you ever have before. And he led me to this particular chapter when God was speaking through the prophet Samuel to Saul. And God had given Saul a grace that had not been put on anyone else up until that time. You see, the children of Israel for 400 years were being tormented and intimidated by the Amaleks. And God spoke through Samuel to Saul and said, I'm going to put a grace upon you and my people and what you couldn't conquer in the past, you'll overcome this year. And the Lord spoke to me so clearly and he said, Obed, in 2024, I'm about to put a grace upon the church that the devils they couldn't conquer in 2023, come on, you're going to conquer in 2024. The doors that couldn't be open in 2023, but because of the grace on your life is going to be open in 2024. And there is going to be a supernatural success, an accelerated abundance that I'm about to give to my people. But it comes with the warning as well. And as I began to dive into this story, Samuel, through God, said, you're to wipe out all the, Abim the Amaleks, not leave anything behind. And the Bible talks that Saul actually spared the king. His people also spared some of the animals. And the grace that was given upon them to achieve the accelerated success that God would have for Israel was lifted off of him. Why? Because partial obedience is really complete disobedience. In other words, in 2024, you cannot have selective obedience. Because we have a church today that says, I want to obey God to do this, but I don't know how to obey God to do that. Like, I, I obey God to pray, but I won't obey God to forgive. And God's saying, if you want this grace that's going to bring an accelerated abundance and supernatural opportunity over your life, it cannot be driven by selective obedience anymore. Come on, how many know if you want the fullness of God's blessings, you got to give him the fullness of your obedience. And there is this overflow that comes with obedience. But what was interesting about this story is we dive deeper into it, and you'll see it throughout the consistency of Scripture, is that success to a believer is not an option. It's a covenant right. Joshua, the book of Joshua, God says, be strong and courageous. And he says, and you will have good success. The reality is, is that you've been taught success from a work ethic, not a covenant ethic. That people that understand their covenant right, knowing that I am in Christ and Christ is in me, the hope of glory. Therefore, I don't walk into business thinking, am I going to get it? No, I walk in. The Bible says if I'm blessed going in, come on, covenant says you're blessed coming out. And so there, there's a covenant right to it. And, 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 and so God, so, so success belongs to us. And what happens is, is that you come in church broken and hurting and God heals you and he touches you. And all of a sudden you start serving and, and the next thing you know, you're giving. And the next thing you know, man, you're loving on Jesus and doors begin to open up. And God begins to give you things that your hearts desire. And if you're not careful. You allow it to get the best of you. God's will for your life is never to be busy. Busy doesn't even exist in the Bible. It's not even a biblical word. It's amazing how people attach success to being busy. Hey, how are you doing? I'm busy. No, busy means that your life is out of order. That's what busy means. Or if you break it down, B-U-S-Y, being under Satan's yoke. The Bible defines success as being fruitful. He says, you'll know they are of me by the fruit they bear. So people that come up to me say, Pastor Robert, are you busy? No, that's an insult. I'm fruitful. Because the enemy understands he can't defeat you. So he gets you busy to wear you down. 
Because when you start getting worn down, you start making poor decisions. And next thing you know, you start living by pressure rather than principle. Come on, can I really preach like it's the last service? And, and so what happens is, is that your life of faith starts off as obedient. Man, you're serving God, you're worshiping God, you're coming to church faithful. And then all of a sudden, the blessings of God, the overflow of your obedience begins to take you places no eyes have seen. Your ears haven't heard. And then all of a sudden, you're busy. And you start missing service. And you start missing your mornings with God. And now what started off as obedience now becomes a sacrifice. Since when coming to church is a sacrifice? Since when waking up in the morning and opening up your Bible is a sacrifice? Since when worshiping the Lord in, in the morning is a sacrifice? When it was obedient when it started off that way. And what happens is if we're not careful, we will allow what started off as obedience to become a sacrifice. Well, I, you know, I mean, you, you were giving. Oh, but man, I, I, that's, that's, that's too much. No, since when did it become a sacrifice? What happened to Saul is he sabotaged his success. Because he allowed what started off as obedience turn into a sacrifice. God doesn't bless you so that you draw away from him. He blesses you so that you remain close to him. Because distance always creates distortion. And so it's important that we understand that if we want the fullness of the blessing, we can't give him partial obedience. This is why in Deuteronomy chapter 28, it starts off by saying, now it shall come to pass, not later, but now. If you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments in which I command you today, that the Lord will set you high. Not your, not your personality, not your gifting. Come on, not, not your ability, not your job, because he ain't job Jireh, he's Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will set you high. The Lord lifts you up. And if the Lord lifts you up and takes you somewhere, he's the only one that can keep you there. And so the Lord takes you there and he sets you high above all the nations of the earth. Which in other words, what God does is that he says in all these blessings, not some. Come on, say it. All these blessings shall come upon you and then they shall overtake you. So in other words, when you're overtaken by something, you're driven by it. So it's the blessings of God that's driving your life. It's not your giftings. It's not your ability. It's, it's the favor. It's the blessing. When you walk in, you're, you're endowed with the blessing of God. When people look at you, they say there's something different because you're being driven by the blessings of God because they overtake you. Why? Because you obey the voice, come on somebody, of the Lord. So then, Pastor Robert, what does obedience mean? Well, obedience in simple terms just means hearing the word of God and acting on it. It's that simple. Then why don't we do it? Because most of us, like today, whether you're watching at the other campus or watching online, you, you hear it because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then if you're not careful, you just allow it just to, you just allow yourself to just hear it, but you don't receive it. If you don't receive it, you can't believe it. If you don't believe it, you won't obey it. So, so how it begins, how obedience begins, it begins by what you hear. People say, I got to guard my heart. No, you need to guard your ears. The most precious entity of your life that you need a guard are your ears because whatever gets to your ears gets to your mind what gets to your mind gets to your heart and whatever gets to your heart comes out of an action so in other words if i hear it 
I think it. If I think it, I believe it. If I believe it, then I speak it. It is why you, you hear negativity, then you think negativity, and then you believe negativity, and then you speak negativity. Why? Because all your voice is, is a byproduct of what you heard. But if I hear faith, I think faith. If I think faith, I believe faith. And if I believe faith, come on somebody, I walk by faith. You just don't walk by faith by walking by faith. You got to hear it, then you believe it, then you receive it. Come on, and then you walk by it. Come on, you got to hear it, you got to think it, you got to believe it, you walk by it, and then you say it. So I hear it, I say it. I say it because I heard it. And so all your mouth is, is a revealer of your heart. I don't need to look into your heart to see what's in your heart. I just need to hear what comes out your mouth. And so faith, it comes by what? Come on, it comes by what? So if faith comes by hearing, so does doubt. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, which means doubt cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of man. So faith comes by hearing. I hear it. Watch this. I hear it. I receive it. I believe it. And then I walk it. Come here. So why doesn't, why is it so hard to obey God? Why is it, Pastor Obed, that I struggle? Like I really want to obey him in these areas, but why do I struggle? It's simple. Because when you often come to church or you, you, you just walking in life, you pick up trash. And when you pick up trash, you don't hold on to truth. Your hands are occupied holding burdens, so they're not open to receive blessings. And so this is the world. This is doubt. It's fear. It's anxiety. It's worry. It's everything you're not supposed to be carrying. Matter of fact, Jesus says you only got to carry one thing. He says, carry my cross. But you pick up all kinds of other stuff. You pick up worry. That don't belong to you. You pick up fear. That wasn't meant for you to hold on to. You pick up anger. No, no, no. You pick up a bad day. No, no, no. You, you've allowed a bad day. You have a bad moment, but you're the one that turned it into a bad day. You don't have a choice of a bad moment but you do have a choice to turn a bad moment into a bad day and so what do you do? you hold on and so you come to church and you're like oh man i came to church i'm gonna go to ocean church man pastor mark they're so cool i love I, pastor rochelle she is bomb right and and then you come your friend invites you and the next thing you know you hear the word of god and well you heard it but you didn't receive it because you're still holding on the trash when you've been given truth and the next thing you know, you're like, this God ain't real. Oh, no, no, God's real. You just haven't been real. And so then you go, oh, I'm, I'm going to give oceans another chance. I'm going to come. And you come and Pastor Mark's preaching, anointing gets you. And guess what? You drop it. And now all of a sudden, in one hand, you have truth. The other hand, you have trash. So you believe on Sunday, but you doubt on Monday. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. What am I trying to tell you? You're not struggling to obey God because you don't love him. I know you love him. You're struggling to obey God because all you've done is hear it. You didn't receive it to believe it, to trust it, and then to obey it. And so what happens, the enemy gets you, he knows how to get you. He gets you frustrated because it's not happening. And so what do you do? You drop the word. And as you drop the word, you go back to picking up your trash. And now you're like, oh God, I need a miracle. And God says, okay, go back to Ocean's Church. I'm a, and God says, okay, now I'm going I'm to whiplash you now. And Pastor Mark preaches, all of a sudden, you drop the trash because now you're holding on to truth. And so when the trash 
tries to make its way back into your life the doubt the worry no you're holding on to the truth the truth shall set you free and the truth shall keep you free you know what the truth says about you I'm the head and not the tail I'm above and not beneath I'm blessed going in and I'm blessed coming out I am more than a conqueror oh no devil I shall fear I'm not going to fear because though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I shall fear no evil because lo he is with me And so it's easy to obey when you're holding on to truth. And so you're not just fighting battles anymore. You're fighting to hold on to truth. Thank you, man. And so what you got to realize is who's your adversary? Who is he? Well, John talks about it. John says, John chapter 8 says, when he lies. What do you mean when he lies? I thought that was my ex-boyfriend. No, no, no. <laughs> When, when he lies, <laughs> forgive him, Lord. He speaks, watch this, his own native language because he's the father of lies. Let me tell you a little bit about your adversary. He's not a fallen devil. He's a fallen angel. Understand this. He's not a fallen devil. He's a fallen angel. Angels were created to only see to the horizon. They were never given the ability to see into your tomorrow. Amen. It's why Jesus answered the question about tomorrow. And he says, no, no, tomorrow is in my hands. Because Jesus is the only one that can see into your tomorrow. Because he limited angels to only see to the horizon. Well, if the devil can't see your future, what does he always have a conversation with you about? Your past. The devil's never going to tell you, you're going to take that territory. The devil's never going to tell you, that home's going to be yours. Your devil's never going to tell you, that child's going to get saved. He's never going to tell you that because he doesn't speak to your future because he can't see your future. He's the father of lies. So every time he speaks, you got to shut him up because what is he trying to do? He's trying to make you change direction so that you go backwards instead of going forward. But the Bible says those who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God, which means we're headed to where we're going going because we left behind what we came out of come on you ought to give the lord a clap offering this morning come on i'm not having a conversation with the person that's going to lie to me all the time i serve the truth and the truth shall set you free oh i feel god in this place now boy help me let me go further he's a distinct angel which means he was created distinctively different than any other he was a worshiper and there was only two other angels God created more distinctively Gabriel was the messenger and Michael was the fighter Lucifer got pride and when pride walks in God walks out he sabotaged his success and what started off as obedience became a sacrifice I have to be here. I have to do this. And God says, okay, you're out. And for a moment, in eternity, heaven still had its fight because it had Michael. It still had his message because it had Gabriel. But it lost its worship because Lucifer was gone. And God says, I'm going to do something. I'm going to create a duplicate. And what was on him, I'm going to put it on them. And God created human beings to be spirit beings. And he made them to be worshipers. See, the devil doesn't hate you because of you. Because every time he sees you, he sees himself. How your worship used to get the attention of God. He can't worship no more. This is why the best weapon you have when the devil comes against you, you start opening up your mouth. You don't open up your mouth and talk about worry. You talk about worship. You just start singing. And all of a sudden, it gets opens up the heavens. And when the heavens open up, my friends, God gets the attention. Because why? What was on him is now on you in Jesus' name. Here's
here's what you got to realize is when we believe a lie, we empower the liar. Your enemy is only as strong as you make him. Well, Pastor, you know, I just keep on fighting the enemy. Why? Do you understand, man? I've been going through all kinds of stuff. Why? Well, I'm going through trials and tribulations. Well, Paul says you always come out of it better than what you had when you walked into it. Rejoice. Why? Because you're not a victim. You're victorious now. The greater one lives inside of you. You talk to every successful person, they'll tell you. How did you become successful? What, what, what defined it? They never refer to something that was good. They always said the hardest battle brought the best out of something. Paul says rejoice when you go through trials and tribulations. Why? Because you always come out of it with more faith than you have than you walked into it. Come on, you would never know he's a healer if you were never sick. You would never know he's your provider if you were never broke. You would never know he's the God of your salvation if you were never lost. Friends, the fact that you went through it is the fact that you get to know more of who he is in your life. So you're not just going through it just to go through it. You're going through it because he's making something out of you that's already inside of you that you don't have a revelation of yet. And all of a sudden, who you are today is somewhat different than who you were yesterday. Not because of what you did, but because what you came through. When we believe a lie, we empower the liar. Yeah, right. So look what John says. John says, love has been perfected. Yeah. It's been perfected among us. In this, that we may have his boldness in the day of judgment. Watch this. Because as he is, yeah. not as he was, yeah. not as, about, as he's about to, as he is, yeah. so are we. Yeah. As he is, not as he was, not as he's about to going to be, as he is, so are we. Say that. As he is, so are we. Say it again. As he is, so are we. Why could God say that? What would give Jesus the right to speak through John to say that? Because when God created man, he didn't create them as a substance. He created them as a reflection. It's the only thing that God created. When God created a tree, it's a tree. It will always be a tree, and it could be nothing but a tree. When God created a dog, it's a dog. It can never be nothing else but a dog. When God created the sun, it's the sun. It will always be the sun. It can never be nothing but the sun. When God created the oceans, I'm talking about the real... When God created the seas, they'll be the seas. They can only be the seas. Because God created them as a substance. But when he created man, he created them as a reflection. And so, when, when you were in sin, it's why you look like it. I don't need to know you're taking drugs. You reflect it. I don't need to know you drink alcohol. You reflect it. You don't need to tell me you're depressed. You reflect it. You'll never know your dog's depressed. You'll never know if a tree's depressed. Because they weren't created as reflections. They were created as substance. But there's something powerful about being created as a reflection. And that is the fact that you've been given the identity of your father, which is in heaven. So people ought to know you're saved because you reflect that you're saved. People ought to know that you're blessed because you reflect that you're blessed. People ought to know that you got joy because you're reflecting joy. People ought to know that you're peace because you're reflecting peace. It is why the first attack in the Bible was not to break a family. It was identity. Yeah, that's right. What did he tell Eve? He says, if you eat of that tree, you'll be like God. Like God. Man wasn't created to be like God. We were created to be God-like. 
like God means I am, I am the substance. God like means I'm the reflection. Every time you sin, it's you switch positions. You say, I'm going to be like God, which means I'm going to have control. God, I'm going to do it my way. And you go from reflection to deception. Boy, I feel God in this place right now. This wisdom's flowing. Someone's getting healed right now. The first attack was identity. The first attack of Jesus out of him being baptized was he took him up to the mountain. What did the enemy say to him? If ye be the son of God. What do you mean if, if thou be the son of God? Don't you know who I am? Identity. Why do you think your whole life the devil's been attacking your identity? Why? Because your image is connected to your dominion. The Bible says, let us make man in my image and give him dominion. And so your dominion is attached to your image. This is why when you lost your image in sin, you had no power to dominate. It's why it dominated you. That addiction dominated you. That perversion dominated you. But as soon as you got that rightful image and you took on the image of God, that spirit of a dominator came upon you where you are walking in the authority of God. And all of a sudden you can speak to those things that be not as though they already are. And it's I'll obey your voice because it's the reflection that they're afraid of not you but the one that you reflect in Jesus name as he is come on as he is so are we which means you have his life you have his mind you have his nature you have his name you have his ability you have his power you have his wisdom you have your favor you have his love see it's not he just didn't give you image he gave you likeness, which means you're to act like him, which gives you no permission to be rude. It's why when you, when you act outside of who he is, it doesn't feel right. Even when you know you, like, you know, you know when you, like, you, you, you yelled at someone and you're like, mm, mm, mm. And then you walk away and you're like, you're such an idiot. Why did you do that? Now you need, what made you feel bad? You? No, you were just parading it just a few seconds ago. It's because at the end of the day, you were never created to be that. He gave you image, likeness, dominion. As he is, so are we in this world. He's not talking about when you get to heaven. You're supposed to be as he is up there, right down here in this world. And if it's all blessings, favor, <laughs> increase, love, joy, peace, discipline, if it's all up there, come on, you can have it down here because as he is, so are, so are we. So the enemy has spent all his life, all your life, telling you, what you're not. And you've used it as a crutch. Right? You don't wear crutches unless you have pain. And the goal is, of a crutch is for you to avoid the pain. And so we've, 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 we've avoided dealing with what's dealing with us. Well, my family, I was raised. Oh, no, no, we're going to get to that. But he's used it against you. Because now you have a different reflection. Now you're obeying God and you're walking in this overflow. And he's trying to stop you. Because he doesn't know your future. Come on. All he can talk to you is about your what? God never brings you out of something. Unless what he's bringing you into is already created. When he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt... There was already a land flowing with milk and honey. Why are you so concerned about where you're going? I would be concerned if I'm leading myself. But if he's leading you, it's already created. Or he'd have never brought you out in the first place. 
And so, so, so God is always taking you to a place is already been created. Why? Because God always begins at the end and works his way back to the beginning. That's the mind of God, Isaiah 46, 19. God declares everything from the end to the beginning. So as you are starting, God has already finished. So you're coming from this direction, going from here to there. God speaks to you from there to here. Joseph, you're 17 years old. I'm going to give you a dream. You're going to be second in charge. He showed him what was there when he would turn 30, when he was here at 17. 13 years from here to there. But when God spoke, that which would be there, he was speaking to Joseph when he was, he was here. So God speaks to you here about there. But what he doesn't reveal to you is what's in the middle. Because if he would have spoke here and then said, okay, there is going to be, you're going to be sold out by your brothers and thrown into a pit. And then, oh God, show me what's next. Okay, next you're going to go into Potiphar's palace. And you're going to get falsely accused because she came out in her Victoria's Secret. And you said, look at the palm because you went the bomb. And then you get charged. Then all of a sudden, God, you got to show me what's that. Then he takes you to a prison. And now you're in Pharaoh's palace. And then you interpret the dreams of a baker and a butler. And all you ask them is, dude, just remember me when you get out. And when they get out, they get amnesia. <laughs> How many of you know that if God spoke to you that here, you would sit there and say, nah, God, you need, a, you need to have somebody else. That ain't for me. Stop asking God what's next. If God showed you you're there, just trust him. Here, there. You may go through a valley. You may have a setback. But if God said it, come on, he will do it in Jesus. Because your whole, I, I got to hurry up. You got to get to lunch and there's no football. What does he say about you? Because you've heard all your life what the enemy says about you. You're no good. You're nothing. People look at you and they see the front cover, but they don't see the chapters of your life. Look at my life. Bald head. <laughs> Married to a beautiful, beautiful girlfriend. 23 years. Beautiful children. She's white. I'm cinnamon. <laughs> my kids are butter. <laughs> We make some good cinnamon toast. Come on, somebody. If I was raised in a Christian home, got hooked on drugs and alcohol, left my house at 12 years old because my dad left us, kicked out of eight schools, in and out of prison, came out at 16 years old on a Monday out of jail. My mama told me, hey, baby, you need to go to church. I said, mama, I ain't going to church. Baby, I visited you all these years you need to go to church. I said, Mama, church full of hypocrites. She said, Mijo, you fit perfectly. I said, I ain't going to church. She says, Mijo, there's some beautiful girls at church. I said, Mama, I'm going to church. <laughs> Went to church on a Wednesday. You pastor said, you pastor said, there's camp this Friday. In my mind, I'm not going. So the next day I'm at the house. Get a phone call. Mom comes in the room and says, son, it's a youth pastor. I said, mama, I promise you, I didn't do nothing. <laughs> she says, no, no, he wants to talk to you. Invites me to youth camp. I said, I ain't going to youth camp. He says, there's going to be a lot of pretty girls up there. I'm going to youth camp. <laughs> I am giving my life to Jesus. 16 years old, never looked back. Lost my mother. Lost my brother to sudden deaths. 
you will never see the tragedy. You never see the victim. Because he works all things for the good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. If he'd have showed me that here, when he showed me what would be there, I'd probably say, Lord, I ain't signing up. But what does he say about you? What does he say about you? Well, the first thing he says is that you're a new creation, which means there's no evidence of what you used to be. Remember, the devil only knows who you were. He doesn't know who you're becoming. So this is why, watch this, you can't be who you're meant to be by acting like how you used to be. <laughs> Let me rewind that one more time. You can't be who you're meant to be by still acting like how you used to be. He says you're a new creation. Matter of fact, Galatians, Paul's writing, he says, you're an heir to the blessing of Abraham. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have to be a byproduct of a dysfunctional family. You broke that. You're an heir to the blessing of Abraham, Galatians chapter 3 says. What does that mean? You can't punish your future by still blaming your past. Stop telling yourself that you can't. If God put that business inside of you, go after it. If God put that dream inside of you, go after it. Come on, if you were a relentless sinner, why don't you be a relentless believer? Come on, if you weren't afraid of drugs and alcohol, you ought to not be afraid of devils and demons. Because at the end of the day, no fear has ever held you back. You just tried it and went for it. Why don't you do it for the kingdom in Jesus' name? Come on, I got to hurry up. You're an overcomer. That's what he says. He says, you're an overcomer. Which means what? You have no excuse to live overwhelmed when you're called to overcome. You think God going to bless you so you're overwhelmed? God, give me success. And the next thing, you're overwhelmed. And you're an overcomer. He says, you're an imitator of God. What? Yeah, you're an imitator of God. <laughs> Which gives you no excuse. Well, that's just the way I am. Ain't nobody cares who you are. You're an imitator of God. Now, when your dog barks and you tell him to stop, if he doesn't stop, you can get mad at him because he ain't imitating no one. But you have his reflection and you have his likeness. You're an imitator of God. People may never walk in this church until they first see you. If, if you serve this God, I want some of him. I walk into business meetings, and they, they want to negotiate contracts. Let's negotiate. First thing I tell them, negotiation is exaggeration. It's exaggeration. I don't exaggerate because I don't want to sin. So here's my bottom line. I'm not going to waste your time. You're not going to waste my time. I have character and integrity. It's more better than this contract. It's a secret for some of you guys. Sign up for my coaching. I'm <laughs> I don't have it. <laughs> Trust me, I don't. Light of the world. He says you're the light of the world. Which means don't let the cares of life throw shade on your shine. You ought to be shining every day. Not whining, shining. He says you're justified by faith. Which means you walk by faith and not by feelings. In the past, you walked by feelings. But you now walk by what? By faith. The only times you revert back to your feelings is when you can't have clarity of what's ahead. The Bible talks about it with Isaac. Remember Isaac? He was about to bless his son Esau. He says, go get me some game. And then when you come, I'm going to bless you. Well, Rebecca overheard it. She tells Jacob, go kill an animal. I'm going to make your dad some stew. So he comes Kills the animal, brings the stew. She makes the stew, and then she skins the animal because the word Esau means hairy. So she put the skin of the animal on his hands, on his arms. So Jacob comes, brings his dad the stew. His dad's eyes are dim. He can't see. He has no vision. When you don't have vision, you don't have no clarity. And he goes, Dad, I'm here to bring you stew. 
And his dad says, come a little closer. Right. Let me touch you. Because you sound like Jacob. Yeah, right. But you feel like Esau. Right. And he landed up giving the wrong child the blessing. Why? He made a decision based on feelings. Wow. And not his voice. Not hearing the voice. Wow. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Wow. Feelings give in to pressure when you're no longer making decisions based on principles God doesn't respond to pressure but he has to respond to principles and so when when feelings come you got no 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 I'm not making decisions based on pressure I'm making decisions based on principles why because God honors principles come on somebody he's not moved by pressures he says you're highly favored in other words you got to wear your favor Stop apologizing for your blessing. If God's blessed your marriage, talk about it. God blessed you with faith, talk about it. I, don't, I just don't want to talk about it because God's been too good to me. What? Wear your favor. All these years you wore worry. You put on the wardrobe of fear. You talked about it a lot. Come on, wear your favor. In other words, stop trying to be like everybody when you're favored to be somebody. He says you're the source and symbol of the blessing, which means you're blessed to be a blessing because when God puts a dream in your heart, he starts by putting a seed in your hand. You're looking at what's out there. And God says, no, look what's right here. What's out there is what I do. What's right here is what you'll do. You'll never get what's out there until you first give me what I put right here. God, here's my seed. Here it is. God says, okay, now I'll give you a dream. The other, he says, you're a partaker of his divine nature, which means everything that belongs to him has been given to you. And then he says this, he says about you, Philippians 4, you can accomplish all things, not some things, all things. Why? Because what looked like a giant last year will become a giant opportunity this year. Why? Because there's a grace upon you. As I close, Psalm 65, this is your verse. You crown the year with a fruitful harvest. The paths are worn down by carts, overflowing with unstoppable growth. What is the overflow of obedience? What is it, Pastor Obed? Well, the first is you'll have unstoppable growth. Which means you'll be recognized by others with no need for self-promotion. You don't ever have to look for acceptance and approval or affirmation from nobody. When it comes from the Lord. The first thing God gave Jesus when he came out of the water wasn't an anointing. What he gave him was affirmation. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Never did a miracle. Never turned water into wine. Never raised the dead. Because there's nothing you'll do to get God to love you more than he already loves you right now. That's why I look in the mirror every day. I look at this bald-headed Puerto Rican. Look at I said, you're affirmed. You're accepted. And you're approved. Jesus will go and he'd heal a person on the Sabbath. His disciples will panic. What are you doing? It's the law. You're not supposed to do this. <laughs> Jesus will tell them. So what am I supposed to do? Tell them to come back tomorrow? No. You want to know why he never worried? Because he was affirmed. The cure to people pleasing is affirmation. The second, he says, I'll give you a unified family. Look what it says in Deuteronomy 28. Your children and your cops will be blessed. The offspring of your herds and your flocks will be blessed. A unified family. In other words, watch this. Your spouse and your children will benefit from your reflected favor. My son, he plays football. He so desperately wanted a coach that would really take liking into him. And we said, let's pray about it. He joined the seven-on-seven -seven travel team. He said, Dad, the DB coach loves me, man. He wants me to train with them. And I said, son, that's awesome. He goes, dad, man, God is good. I said, no, you need to thank me. 
I said, what are you talking about? Thank you. I said, you need to thank me. That was my favor reflecting off of you. Because you walk in obedience. Your children benefit from it. When I was on the streets selling drugs, high, bullets flying over my head, ran up to a car with the sawed off 12 gauge and he missed. That wasn't my favor. That was a mama who never stopped praying for her child. I'm standing up here because I'm standing on someone else's reflected favor. You say, Pastor Obed, I don't have a parent like that. No, you have a savior that was on the cross and said, forgive them for they know not what they've done. You are here today because of a reflected favor called the Father. Jesus of Nazareth today. Watch this really quick. Unlimited blessings. You don't, you won't lack anything you need. Your fruit baskets and breadboards will be blessed. And then lastly, your unmerited favor. How many would like unstoppable growth, unified family, unlimited blessings, and unmerited favor? Well, Pastor Robert, how do I get that? Obedience. Don't hold on to trash. Hold on to truth. People ask me, Pastor Robert, what do you do? Or when I'm on an airplane, it's always a weird conversation. What do you do? I always go, well, I'm a pastorpreneur can't rip it off I own the trademark but I own a software company and my mentor has taught me this many years ago I met a man that grew up in a home of parents who were pastors they didn't have a lot so they would sometimes not have enough and they take the eggs from their chickens and bring it to church as an offering. He'd always live like as if he wasn't worthy because his five other siblings were all called to ministry except him. Kind of lived with this feeling like, God, why haven't you chosen me? And one day he gets a job at a store, becomes a merchant. It's a picture, me and him. And um, Mr. David, Mr. David went back to his mama and said, Mama, I think I found what I love. I'm going to go into business. And Mama, I'm not going into business to make money. I'm going to go to give it away. And so this little Mr. David said, I'm going to start selling picture frames. So he opened up a 600 square foot little store in his city and, and here's the first machine. This was his machine. That little machine right there created those nine picture frames that were drawn up and he'd go and he'd put them all throughout the neighborhood. And he said, God, because you gave me this business, I want to obey you. What do I need to do? God, I just want to put a Bible in every person's hand. God, if you will bless my business and I'll obey you, I just want to put a Bible in every person's hand. Because what good is it to have a dream when you don't have a cause? And he started off making picture frames. One day, Mr. David, his businesses began to grow. Called Hobby Lobby. Stores started taking off everywhere. Every time someone come into the store, he tried to give them a Bible. He started the first year, gave 100 Bibles away. Second year, gave 500, 1,000. But his whole dream was, I'm in the business just to put a Bible in someone's hands. One day, these little kids come to him, little nerds, and they're like, we got this app. It's the Bible that we could put on phones, but we can't afford it. And he knew he was supposed to pay for it. 800 million downloads later, $37 million and counting every year. The first one right there, you version. Started off. Come on, I'm gonna prophesy, right? It's, it's stirring right now. 
It's stirring right now. Come on, business people. It's stirring right now. It had a cause. And the more you grow, the greater the trials, the more difficult it is to obey. He goes through one of his toughest seasons because he's defying the government on something the government said you have to do if you have this many employees. He had a stand on a conviction. He was willing to lose it all. But not lose this. I'm going to hold on to truth. And Mr. And Mr. Green is at the Supreme Court. He tells his family, we may lose everything. But it's just, but God, you know what our dream is. After one of the days, he tells his attorneys, I just need to go for a walk. And Mr. Green goes for a walk and he's walking down in Washington, D.C. He sees a building and the Holy Spirit speaks to him, buy it. He said, huh? I'm in a court case. Jesus says, did I not tell you I'm your advocate? I'll fight every battle. Will you just obey me? He picks up the cell phone, calls his real estate guy, says, there's this building in Washington, D.C. We need to buy it. Mr. Green, we're in a lawsuit. We're probably going to lose everything. Oh, no, we're not losing nothing. Buy it. He lands up buying it on a Monday. They win the case on Friday. I had no idea. Why would I do it? A few weeks later, these people come without an appointment. They say, we're here to see Mr. Green. His secretary says, they flew all the way from Egypt. They want to see you. He says, well, if they came that far, I'll give them some time. They come in and they open up these suitcases and there's artifacts of the Bible, the original writings. They said, sir, we've been collecting for years. And all we need is a building. Who would have known that in the middle of Washington, D.C. is the Bible Museum? $700 million dollars cash no debt come on somebody cash no debt cash no debt that all put that first put, put, put that put that first light up it all started come on put it up it all started with this because if you're faithful with what God places in your hands no eyes have seen no ear has heard all that God has in store for your life. I'm here to prophesy to you. Come on, Ocean's Church. You may see a tent, but God sees buildings after buildings after buildings after buildings. Why? Because if you're faithful with what you got, come on, he's speaking to you here, but he already has there already promised. Sir, your business will succeed. Ma'am, you'll go places your family has never gone. Young man, that dream that's inside of you, don't give up. Keep on going after it. You fight the good fight of faith. You take this Bible and you sit there and say, God, if you said it, you will do it. I'm just going to obey you. This Bible has been tested. This Bible has been tried time after time after time. But today, it still stands as the infallible, incorruptible seed of God. Because God is not a liar. In him there is all truth. And if he says you're blessed, you're blessed. He says if you're favored, you're favored. If he says you'll win, you'll win. If he says you'll make it, you will make it. Come on, give the Lord a big... There's an anointing. Come on, Sandy, your feet. There's an anointing of increase. I was sharing between services, one of the girls that comes to this church, she used to go to ours. She moved out here, Newport Beach, and found oceans. 
we were sharing, I was sharing with her. Our theme for this year in our church is the year of obedience. God says, you'll take this around the world. I don't preach in churches. I, I don't have a lot of time. But he says, wherever I take you, you're going to preach this message. Because I'm putting a grace on certain houses. That what they could not conquer last year, they will overcome this year. The doors that didn't open up for you last year. God says go back knocking on those doors again because that grace is about to hit you in about 30 seconds and that grace like is going to come upon you like it came upon Saul and that wisdom and revelation and insight and foresight creative ideas why because you're a creative being created by the creator to recreate it's who you are and here's what the Lord's saying oceans I just need you to obey me. I've been speaking, okay? Pastor Obed, I, I know I'm supposed to let go of that hurt. Just let it go. As long as you still hold on to it, they're still part of your life. You may not see them, but they're still part. No, detach yourself. Obey God's voice. Pastor Obed, I need to forgive that boss that laid me off. Forgive him because you'll thank him a year from now when you're his boss come on somebody because he set you high above you'll let it go i lost everything i lost most of everything last year no god took record and he says i'll restore the years that the locusts and the canker worm have stolen back to you you didn't lose it it's lost to you because it's out of sight but to me I know where it is and I'm telling you I'm the one that removed it because it was taking you down a path that I'd lose you and you are more worth to me than what I blessed you with and now God's about to restore it and you're gonna obey him and when God blesses you supernaturally and it's time to building and it's time for this you're not gonna give because of a sacrifice you give because you're obeying God that's not a sacrifice well we're gonna open up our building we need a hundred new volunteers can someone do once a month that's not a sacrifice that's obedience well pastor Obed I'm not well, pastor Mark I'm not I, I, I'm busy no, no no you're not called to be busy you're called to be fruitful you take care of God's house come on he'll take care of you he'll bless you like never before come on oceans are you ready to have the best year of your life in Jesus name come on lift your hands wherever they're at I want you to say this Jesus no say it like you mean it Jesus these are your hands an extension of heaven here on earth I promise to keep these hands open and never close them I want to receive and I want to give my time my talent my treasure and my trust into your hands today do I commit my life I commit these hands and now God will you put a grace upon me to be a conqueror and to take back what the enemy has stolen this year will be my greatest year ever because I'm walking in obedience and I will experience the overflow of obedience because your word says if I will obey you and hear your voice you'll command the blessing on me and it will overtake me as long as I obey you so thank you for a second chance to obey you. I will never allow success to come before you. You are my source and everything else is my resource in Jesus name. Come on, if you receive that, say amen. Come on, say amen and amen. Now listen, with every head bowed and every eyes closed, we never like to end a service without giving you the opportunity to say, I want Jesus to be a part of my life. And maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor Obed, I feel distanced. 
I feel like I haven't been obedient and I've walked away for some things in God that I need to return back to friends I'm not gonna I'm just gonna speak it the Spirit of God's already here and if that's you today and say today I'm gonna rededicate my life on the count of three just lift your hands one two three lift them up wherever they're at God bless you 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 way in the back God bless you will you say this with me say dear Jesus forgive me of my sins come into my heart and be the Lord of my life Jesus thank you for loving me I want to love you and serve you the rest of my life in Jesus name come on and all God's people say God bless you thank you so much